at Packard Bell Service and Support, we can solve just about any problem. Packard Bell, the computer the world comes home to. Featuring the Intel Pentium 2 Prime. In the previous episode, we covered Packard Bell's meteoric rise from a twinkle in an ambitious man's eye through to becoming the fourth largest consumer computer seller in the United States by 1994. We saw that Packard Bell had become a major player by absolutely dominating a sales channel that had been ignored by other PC suppliers at the time. Packard Bell created computers that were cheaper than their competitors, had more features, and most importantly, they targeted price-conscious first-time computer buyers in mainstream shops on the high street. In this concluding part, we will look at what happened through the 90s as the explosive growth, healthy revenues, and consumer confidence dwindled, leading to Packard Bell leaving the United States just before the millennium. Multiple factors were at play, which led to the ultimate demise of this divisive brand, a computer maker which left an indelible mark on many of my generation. Packard Bell's core business model relied on high volume sales to generate profit from their razor thin margins. As a private company, it had no obligations to reveal its earnings to the market, though in 1994, analysts believed that the company was turning a profit, but estimated at only about three to five cents for every one dollar of sales. But because they were selling at such comparative high volumes, then from the $1.25 billion in revenues generated in 1993, this would equate to somewhere between 37 and $62 million which would be reinvested into the business to fund further growth. But could sales be sustained as the consumer PC market started to mature and become increasingly cutthroat? One of the downsides of retail sales is that you have to follow certain standards that consumers expect and that the retailers need to offer. One of the biggest issues Packard Bell faced were the relatively higher product return rates compared to computer industry standards of the time. This was driven by the standard return and exchange policies that most retail companies adhere to. First time buyers may have a change of heart on such a large purchase and retail stores had to take back returned items. These return computers and monitors went back to Packard Bell. Now keep this return stock in mind as we will come back to them a little later in the story as they play a significant part in the company's eventual downfall. In any case, competitors and detractors of Packard Bell were happy to use these negative return rate percentage statistics to fuel consumer opinion that Packard Bell created machines that were cheap and of poor quality. In spite of this, the company's revenues rose to $2.8 billion in 1994 and then climbed to $4.3 billion in 95, though they openly advised that they didn't make a profit in 1995 citing that it didn't sell enough inventory to cover overheads even on such large revenues. Red flags were already flapping disconcertingly, but these results definitely caught the eye of investors and the company stakeholders. As the mid-90s rolled on, Packard Bell started to be squeezed by other computer suppliers that sold custom-built machines via direct mail and catalogs. They had far lower overheads and were able to undercut Packard Bell and sell at a lower price point pinching a portion of that low end of the market away. Computer ownership by the masses was becoming the standard and consumers were starting to be comfortable with buying computers via mail order rather than only from a high street shop. As well as these new budget competitors, the big boys such as Compaq, HP and IBM also started to fight back. Compaq sued Packard Bell in 1995 for unfair and deceptive practices, but more importantly also accused Packard Bell of disassembling return products, taking the components and reusing them in computers that were then sold as new. This was extremely damaging for the brand in the US market and their scandal dogged the company. Packard Bell countersued alleging unfair competition and defamation. But Packard Bell was recycling memory chips, motherboards, graphics cards, and other valuable parts from personal computers returned from the retailers. The company then screened and tested the PC components, salvaged parts that worked and installed them into the new systems. Experts at the time expressed concerns that the parts could still be defective or degraded and should be avoided. 
but Larry Fisher, spokesman with Paco Bell at the time, tried to contain the shitstorm. He said that it doesn't matter if a computer contains recycled parts if the consumer doesn't have a problem. And if the consumer does have a problem, it would be covered under warranty. He continued to say, in inverted commas, that I think consumers are a little confused about what recycled PC parts are. They are perfectly good and they don't wear out like automobile parts do because they are not exposed to friction. However, I don't think this quelled many consumers' fears about the quality of the end product and whether or not the components within their $2,000 computer were going to perform as expected for the lifetime of the computer. In parallel, the big computer giants also brought out competitive new consumer-grade models with quality components by discounting any losses against their higher-end server and business machine sales. These machines were also put into retail stores, emulating Paco Bell's tactics, but Compaq and Hewlett Packard had the benefit of better brand identification with US consumers and didn't need to be priced quite as low. Consequently, their market share started to creep back up. Packard Bell themselves did not have the benefit of corporate or server machine profits to offset the lower margin consumer products. But in 1996, they entered into a $300 million agreement with Tokyo-based NEC, which gave Packard Bell potential access to the corporate PC, notebook, and server markets, and also gave them access to NEC's computer components at a discounted rate to lower their overall cost of production. Revenues remained flat in 1996 at $4.3 billion, and again, they didn't make a profit, this time attributing it to the costs of consolidating operations with NEC Corp's personal computer division, as well as still combining operations with Zenith Data Systems, the government and education computer supplier they merged with in 95 as part of the Group Bull investment. These consolidation overheads were negating any benefits the mergers were meant to bring. The execs at Packard Bell were increasingly aware that the low end of the market was now becoming too crowded, and so they tried to cultivate a market for its new higher end computers, which targeted second time buyers, while trying to keep its budget computer market share intact. The second time buyer was identified as critically important, as building brand loyalty was key to driving larger profit margins and continuing to grow revenues. They also were prolific at spinning out multiple models, sometimes reacting to the market and putting out a model with a slight feature change within weeks due to its tightly incorporated manufacturing chain. Packard Bell launched its first multimedia advertising campaign in 1996 with cable and national TV spots. It was somewhat dark and controversial, though at its core, it was aimed to elevate brand awareness and establish itself as a credible provider of higher-end systems for the discerning consumer. New designs also appealed to new customers and included quirks like being able to swap the look of the machine by swapping out colored panels. But Compaq wrestled the US retail crown from Packard Bell in the middle of 1996. By the end of the year, Packard Bell's retail market share declined by 40% to 18%. Overall, however, the company claimed some 8.5% of the 7.7 .7 million PC units sold, heading Dell, Gateway and Hewlett Packard. Dell and Gateway eventually zoomed past Packard Bell, largely on the strength of direct sales, under which PC manufacturers shun wholesale and retail middlemen and sold directly to the customer. The issue of recycled parts also came back to bite and via a court ruling beginning January the 1st, 1997, Packard Bell had to place disclosure labels on the outside of cartons when containing monitors and PCs with used parts. It also agreed to pay $1.5 million to the 22 states which had legislation that Packard Bell had broken by not notifying consumers of the reuse of parts. A new ad campaign in 1997 was softer and warmer and the two 30 second spots take on the two issues where Packard Bell had invested heavily to repair past problems, namely customer service and quality. All the marketing and new products for both the low end first time buyer and the high end premium consumer were not translating into enough sales to turn a profit for the company however. By 1998, the repurchase rate for a Packard Bell computer had plummeted from 46% down to 33%, and the two main shareholders, NEC and Group Bull, had lost patience and ousted the principal founder, Benny Allergen, as the CEO. 
He declined to stay on as chairman and rather wished to pursue his own new interests, which speaks volumes to what must have been the relationship and differences of opinion between the former founder and the company's main stakeholders. With a main evangelist and visionary exiting the company, with more competitive entrants like e-machines further disrupting the market with $500 machines, being unable to adjust its sales channels to take advantage of the growing internet opportunity, and with absolutely irreparable issues with brand perception in the US market, Packard Bell was in a death spiral and ended up posting significant losses in 1997 and 1998. So, in 1999, after investing over $2 billion, parent company NEC announced it would start seeking a buyer for the brand, as it completely pulled its operations from the US and concentrated instead on smaller markets such as the Netherlands. NEC closed Packard Bell's assembly plant in Sacramento, California and laid off 80% of the 2,600 employees there and stopped selling in the US altogether. Alain Calder, the former Bull executive who ran Packard Bell NEC since 1998, was to resign at the end of the year. The brand was just too tarnished in the US, whereas in Europe, consumer perception was not as negative. This was the final nail in the coffin for Packard Bell in America as they ceded their share of the PC market. From 1986 to 1999, it was a glorious run, a fantastic story of an upstart that hit the market at the prime time and maximized the number of excellent business decisions to come from nowhere to being a major player. The computer industry was volatile, fast moving, and the technology was innovating and changing at a ridiculously rapid pace in those days. And at the end of the day, Packard Bell couldn't scale quickly enough to stay afloat for the long term. And that, my friends, is the tale of the rise and fall of Packard Bell, a true rags to riches story. If you would like to see more historical videos like this, then please pop in a comment so that I know to create more. As always, although I have researched this, it's always easy for a mistake to make its way in. If you spotted one, then also please call it out in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, then give it a like, a dislike if you didn't, and consider subscribing for more 90s PC content.